the Lawrence County Oral History Project. Uh, this is Norm Taylor, your host, and uh, I'm glad that you are with us again today. A little bit different program than what you're accustomed to. Uh, we always have our veterans, and we're going to have our veterans back. Lee Hutchison, he'll be back in uh, uh, for some shows a little bit later on. But today we want to touch on a subject that's very dear to a lot of Lawrence County people's hearts. We're going to be talking about the uh, Virgil Grissom Memorial at uh, Spring Mill State Park. You know, the Spring Mill State Park has been a uh, jewel for Lawrence County. It is uh, one of the most beautiful places that I believe you could go to, one of the greatest state parks that are uh, available to us, and it's just right here in our own county. What a restful place. I spent a lot of time there in the, in the village. Uh, being a Civil War reenactor, I, I get to uh, do a lot of living history there. Uh, and uh, I just enjoy being there, especially in the evenings. I enjoy walking the trails. Uh, just being in a, a very relaxed, peaceful setting as Spring Mill State Park is. It's something that I've grown to appreciate more as I became an adult. Uh, growing up there, around here, uh, you know, we just we went to uh, Spring Mill on school outings and uh, we had reunions at Spring Mill and, and uh, Mom and Dad, we'd go on picnics and, at Spring Mill State Park. And, but, you know, as I became an adult, I became a little bit more uh, the realization of how important it is to us in our county, our economy, uh, and just to us as a people here. And I've grown to appreciate Spring Mill State Park e even more, it, uh, especially since it went to an 1863 setting, since uh, my area of interest and hobbies are, is uh, concerning the Civil War. Uh, now that it's 1863, I've been able to participate more in the living histories there. So it's been a great experience and a great uh, thing for me to be involved with Spring Mill State Park. And the Virgil Grissom Memorial there is something that, uh, again, if you haven't had time to go and to look at, it is well worth your time to do that. Several years ago, in fact, in uh, around 1980, I had some uh, guests from Arkansas that uh, was up here in the county. I was showing them around uh, the different things back then, uh, looking at the limestone quarries and uh, some of the other things that uh, perhaps promoted our limestone heritage. But I took them over to Spring Mill State Park as well. Took them over to the Grissom Memorial. They were all fans of Virgil Grissom, and they were amazed at the museum. It really left an impression on me because, again, I was seeing the, the museum through someone else's eyes, through an outsider's eyes. And it, it even uh, it revealed in me, prompted in me, a greater appreciation for Spring Mill and for the Virgil Grissom Memorial. Back in the 1960s, early 1960s, my father took me to a parade in Mitchell. I honestly don't know what year, I don't remember. I was pretty young. Some of you out there listening may remember or may know the year. If you do, send me an email and let me know what year I'm talking about. But he was the uh, parade marshal uh, at, during that time being honored. And he was in Mitchell that year. All I know was in the 1960s. And I remember getting to see Virgil Grissom in a convertible that year. So actually, I got to see him with my own eyes. It wasn't too many years after that that I know that uh, he, when I learned of his tragic death, I believe it was in January of 1967. So uh, when you think of Lawrence County and the important people that came out of Lawrence County, surely at the top of that list would have to be the name of Virgil Grissom the second man in space, one of the original seven of the Mercury astronauts. And some believe that perhaps if it hadn't been for his tragic death in 67, that he may have been uh, one of the first, maybe the first man that would ever walked on the moon. But we appreciate the life of Virgil Grissom. I appreciate those people that had the insight to create a Virgil Grissom Memorial, and those that are now taking time in Mitchell to renovate his childhood home. We believe in preservation in this program. That's why we do this program, and we want to keep the memory of Virgil Grissom alive. 
Saying that, I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, I know uh, Jill through uh, my reenacting efforts at uh, Spring Mill, and uh, we have Jill Vance with us. Jill, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. And this is the first time you've ever been on this program. It is. Well, <laughs> and uh, we're, we're glad to have you today. And Jill, give us a little bit of background of uh, where you're from mm -hmm. and uh, who you are. I know you're working with the Department of Natural Resources. How many years you, have you been with them? I've been with, uh, with the DNR uh, full-time for about three and a half years, and I was seasonal for two years before that, oh. so wow, you're a five veteran and a half now. years overall, I guess. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and what, 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 what got you interested in working uh, with uh, the DNR? I uh, actually ended up being kind of a lucky accident that I actually even found out this sort of job existed. Um, I came out of my master's degree out of college at IU, not really knowing thinking I knew what I wanted to do, but um, kind of second guessing that that was maybe the right path for me. And I was lucky to get a seasonal job in McCormick's Creek State Park. Uh -huh. And it was the sort of thing, two weeks into it, this is what I want to do. This is it. I can't believe something like this actually exists. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was wonderful. Uh, and it just made me, reminds, what I do now reminds me of all those great experiences I had visiting parks uh, when I was a child and everything I got out of them. And mm -hmm. Now I get to do that for other people. Did you actually ever go to Spring Mill when you were a kid? Uh, I did not, but my parents actually had their honeymoon at Spring Mill Is State right? Park. Mm -hmm. They stayed there in the uh, inn? They stayed in the inn. In fact, they were back uh, just a couple years ago for their anniversary, mm -hmm. and they made sure that they, they my mom keeps insane records and stuff. She was actually able to look at her records, figure out the room number that they wow. stayed in for their honeymoon, and arranged to stay in that same room <laughs> when they came back. Isn't that a great inn? I mean, it really is. It, it is It is a peaceful place. You know, it's kind of set back there in the woods setting, and uh, in, in the uh, wintertime, you can kind of get a, a look at the uh, lake uh, mm -hmm. from certain parts of the, um, mm -hmm. the inn, but it's just a beautiful setting of that. Uh, it really there. is. I believe that that was built somewhere maybe in the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, construction right? started in 1937, and then mm -hmm. they opened in 1939, so so it's okay. been around for a while. Yeah, it sure has. Uh, was this a WPA uh, project? Uh, it started out be actually being CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, the CCC actually built the foundation of the inn. And then I'm not positive who finished it out, but I think it was a privately contracted uh, okay. job to actually finish on top of that foundation. You know, Joe, I've always wanted to do a show on the CCC. Actually, that was a ca there was a camp there. It, the CCC has always been fascinating to me. Uh, and actually, I know there was a camp there at Spring Mill of CCC. Civilian, actually, two. Was there, were there, there were two? actually two. Mm -hmm. Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, and it was a program that was... Uh, initiated uh, under the Roosevelt administration, mm -hmm. early in the Roosevelt administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it actually, uh, it was interesting to me because it was kind of set up like a military camp in, in, in so some It was run by the it. military. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and there were camps there. Do you happen to know where the camps were located at? There uh, on the, I do. Okay. Uh, yeah, they're the very first camp, uh, well, the, the two camps are 1536 and 539. Um, 539 is actually kind of an interesting uh, story uh, in and of itself because it was one of the few African-American camps, uh, solely African-American. Is that right? Uh, in fact, uh, 1536 uh, was the first camp, though, to come in, and they were actually a mixed-race camp. Mm -hmm. uh, when they first came into the park and they established over at what we now call Oak Ridge, uh, the picnic loop over there. Okay. And then um, Camp 539 came in uh, a year, year or two later. And it was kind of interesting. And this was an African American. This was the, an African American one can, camp. Totally mm -hmm. African. Okay. And in fact, when 539 came in, the, the previously integrated 1536. Uh, deintegrated. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually segregated out when 539 came in, and uh, okay. then 1536 became a white only camp. Is that right? Um, mm -hmm. 539 was in the park for about two years or so, and then uh, left. They went out to, I believe, a national park out west, I think they were moved to. Okay. Um, 1536 stayed longer, um, but 539 was located where our service area now is. Okay, in the service area. Now, where is that mm -hmm. located? Uh, uh, that would be right directly across from the Donaldson parking lot. Okay, I know where you're at. And so mm -hmm. that was where the second camp was at? That was where the second camp was located. Yeah, and okay. when 539 left there, 1536 actually abandoned their first camp at Oak Ridge 
and moved over to the, the camp that 539 left behind. Oh, that's interesting. Actually, I tried to do, I, I made a, con a couple of contacts with actually men that were stationed there mm -hmm. at one time, uh, and we valiantly tried to get a program together, but they, these, these guys are getting up to years, the only ones that are left. But I do know they had a reunion. They used to do a reunion there at the, uh, the CCC back a few years ago, at, right at Spring Mill? Yes, and I'm not sure if they did it this year or not. They usually actually do it. Yeah. Uh, right around candlelight tour, if, if I recall right, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure. There's so few of them left, right. unfortunately. That that's true. And and the man uh, that I that was really interested in doing the show with me, it was just he, he was in Ill, Ill health and he wasn't able to come, and I was disappointed. But I've asked. I had a couple contacts from children that was that their parents were involved with that and asked if they ever had a reunion, I would love to go there because I'd love to do a, pr a program on this subject as well. But that's interesting that uh, the camp was there. The camps, uh, are there any surviving photos or anything? Uh, we do actually have a decent amount of, of photos, uh, a lot of them in slide form. Uh, oh. Actually through the uh, YHCC program, uh, the Young Hoosier Conservation Corps, uh, this summer I've had a, a couple of young women who have actually been going through all those slides, digitizing them all for us and inventorying them. So, so uh, we, we now are starting to get a better idea of what, in fact, we do have. And there's just, there's some spectacular pictures. Oh, there. so the, maybe someone would come and maybe uh, once uh, these slides get together, maybe would come and do a show with me on the CCC? Sure. Okay, sure. We've okay. actually even got some video footage from well, an, an interview that was done in the 1980s with one of the CCC men. Oh, okay. One of the well, old this is going to be a future show. <laughs> hey, uh, people out there, you can guarantee that this will, because I've been wanting to do a program on CCC for a long time. This will be a future show. So, Jim, I'm going to have you back and, and, uh, and the people back. And this isn't on the CCC today, but uh, as you know, that anybody that's been watching this show, that for a long time I tend to chase rabbits. But this would be a rabbit worth chasing. Uh, the CC. So we really need stuff. Okay, wow, I, I'm glad to hear that. So I've already been uh, blessed on the program today. But this is about uh, Virgil Grissom. But Jill, first of all, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Uh, well, originally I'm from Holland, Michigan. Uh, I was born there, so I guess I can, can claim to be a Michiganer. Yeah. So I did a little mitten thing. Uh -huh, yeah, <laughs> I always I get it backwards. But <laughs> How far is that from Flint, Michigan? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I, I only lived there for about a year. Okay. And okay. Uh, my father got a job then at uh, Indiana Purdue University, Fort Wayne. Okay. And so we relocated to northeast Indiana. Right. And uh, I grew up in Auburn, Indiana, uh, mm -hmm. just about half an hour north of Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually came down to Bloomington for college mm -hmm. and got married and stayed. <laughs> okay. And uh, so you uh, had your bachelor's degree at IU? Did both my bachelor's and master's at IU. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was your bachelor's and master's in? Uh, my bachelor's was in environmental management, mm -hmm. and then my master's degree is in environmental anthropology. Okay. Now, now did this work out to helping you land a job there in, in, with the DNR somehow? Uh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, you might actually, probably what, what really helped me out is as part of my master's program, I was in the School of Public Environmental Affairs, and one of the requirements to get your master's degree is uh, what they call a capstone project. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you do something that kind of brings together all these different things that you've been working at uh, mm -hmm. into sort of some sort of cohesive whole. Mm -hmm. And I actually did a self-designed capstone project, and I went over to McCormick's Creek State Park, and I wanted to do something that wouldn't just sit on my computer, and I'd look back 20 years ago and say, hey, that was a great paper, too bad, you know. Nothing ever came out of it. Yeah. I wanted to do something that would actually have value to somebody. Yeah. So I talked to the naturalist at McCormick's Creek, uh, Marquita Manley, and uh, got the idea to do a water quality and land use analysis um, around McCormick's Creek. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I did a water quality sample, stream sampling. I looked at land ownership along the borders and basically put together a whole package around that. And through that, got to know Marquita a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated, um, she she hired me on as a seasonal, so that okay. was kind of my start. Wow! And uh, so then you you started out there. Then how did you end up at Spring Mill? I uh, I got lucky, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Marquita uh, 
thought that I should interview when the full-time positions came up and I took her advice and got the shock of my lifetime when they actually called and offered me the full-time position at wow. Spring Mill. So That's great. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Now in a time, in a time I know that they've had cuts uh, you know, in the state parks and I know that uh, you probably have worried about that along with everybody else but I'm glad you survived those cuts and, uh, oh, thank you. and hopefully that, uh, that will continue because you do a good job there. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, Jill, on, uh, you know, when we think of the uh, environmental issues, again, I don't want to chase this rabbit too far, but you know, well, I, you know, I can remember back whenever I was a kid going to the beach there at, at Spring Mill State Park there, and that was a that was a great place to go. And and do you think that we ever will be able to do something with that to restore that? I mean, I know it's going to be extremely costly to get all that fill uh, how that is filled in, but that was a great fishing spot, a boating spot at one time, and you think that ever happened? Gosh, I don't know if I want to commit to anything on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this I, is. I would love to see it happen. So I, I know a lot of people would, but I know it's expensive. The lake but is a really complicated issue, and um, really, this is maybe one of the, the CCC's uh, less desirable legacies is kind of leaving us this problem to deal with. But okay. they, you know, they never anticipated it would be a problem. Yeah. When they put the lake in, because it is a man-made lake. Yeah. Um, they, and it was, and it was beautiful in the time, mm -hmm. really beautiful. And they were, they were judging by other artificial lakes, mm -hmm. looking at, you know, to maintain them as a lake. Mm -hmm. You dredge them once every 50 to 75 years, generally. Yeah. Um, that's very maintainable. Uh, they didn't fully take into account the fact that our lake is cave-fed. All the, the water flowing into the streams, that, and the, that stream is what they eventually dammed up to, to make the lake, mm -hmm. uh, flows out of caves. Mm -hmm. Well, the caves are basically silt banks. <laughs> All the soil washes into them from right. the surface, builds up, gets stirred out, carried back out with the water. And so instead of being a 50 to 75 year dredge cycle, our lake, because of this enormous uh, silt inflow coming out of the cave system, ends up being a 10 to 15 year dredge yeah. cycle. And when you're looking at in the multi-millions of dollars for each dredge, that's why it hasn't been dredged in a long time. Right. Um, it's an issue where if we come up with the money this time, well, 10 years from now, we're going to need that money again, and we're going to be right back where we started. So it's a complicated issue. Uh, so eventually, is it just going to fill up then? And well, it's, it's headed that way pretty quickly yeah. on its own. <laughs> it really is. Um, yeah. In fact, the, the side... We, we kind of look at the lake as kind of two sides divided by the bridge, the, the Nature mm -hmm. Center side and the, the mm -hmm. Donaldson side. And the Donaldson side is, is already completely converted back into wetland. Yeah. Um, it, it would be federally classified as a wetland now. Right. Uh, the Nature Center side is rapidly on its way. Um, so I guess that if, it, if that happens, of course, there will be advantages of having the wetland, too. I mean, there's uh, certainly... Absolutely. From a wildlife perspective, uh, having a wetland there would just be outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of in, I guess you could say, the awkward teenage years <laughs> of a wetland growth right now. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, people, when they come and they look at the lake, they see a lake filled with algae. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. not the most attractive thing to a lot of people's eyes. And... It, it's hard to see, to look 10, 15 years in the future and see what, what this is going to eventually become when it actually mm -hmm. becomes a full-blown wetland. Uh, but when it does, I mean, it'll, it'll just be a wonderful place for birds and all sorts of wildlife. Oh, so, you know, you, we, on one aspect, we, we would lose the, the boating, uh, the fishing, mm -hmm. um, but we would gain a lot more uh, in the wildlife watching uh, and habitat preservation. So, uh, given the, the money you're take. talking about, it looks like it, that's more. Well, we could do a show on that one too. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> e e easy, couldn't we? And that oh, yeah. may be a future show as well, because I'm I'm interested in this issue too. That maybe exploring that. But again, we're on <laughs> Virgil Gris, uh, Gus Grissom, and uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, back in I believe it opened up in uh, around 1971. Is mm -hmm. that is that correct? Yes. And uh, I've had a uh, gentleman that. Uh, uh, Richard Dick Hill that was uh, actually there whenever they were putting that together worked with uh, uh, stay, uh, Spring Mill and so he told me a little bit about that uh, and it was there for the opening back in, uh, in 71. Somebody had a vision for that. Now, I don't know if you would know who that person would have been or that or the people but somebody of course had a vision. 
I'm guessing that probably uh, the tragic loss of uh, Virgil Grissom in 67 probably uh, spurred this on uh, somewhat, you know, because it was a, uh, for years to come, we would have probably been hearing about Gus Grissom. But do you have any knowledge at all about how it was started, somebody that came up with the idea of having the I don't Memorial know of there. any specific names uh, associated with it. My uh, kind of general understanding is uh, after Grissom's death in 67, uh, they kind of started to build locally a movement to, to not forget about him, to, to preserve this memory of this hometown mm -hmm. hero. Mm -hmm. And they started looking at potential places to put a memorial. Mm -hmm. And with the, the park, you know, just three miles down the road and with there being available land there, uh, it just kind of all came together. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know of any specific yeah. names behind it. I just wonder if there was in, would this have happened through grants, or uh, I wonder how this was even paid for at the beginning. Any idea on that? I am not positive. Yeah. I'm not positive. Well, it's a beautiful building, and, and uh, but somebody sure had some, uh, uh, was, was a visionary uh, in that respect, and to have that in there. And what a great uh, jewel for Lawrence County to have that in uh, in our uh, park system and, and here in Lawrence County. Uh, but back just recently, uh, they did a renovation of the, uh, and I, I must admit, I've been in the uh, memorial uh, a few times, but I haven't been there in there since the renovation. But we're going to uh, show uh, our uh, producer, uh, Maria Edwards, and I always mention Maria's name because Maria doesn't get to be on, so you don't know who, what she looks like. Uh, but uh, she does a lot of great work. She was there recently at uh, Spring Mill at the Grist Memorial, and it actually was, uh, took some uh, film of, of the place and of the renovation project, and uh, we're going to see that in, in just a moment. Uh, Jill, uh, do, how many people do you think come to the, uh, just to see the Grist Memorial? I know that most people just come to the park, but how many come just to, you think come to the, just to see this memorial? Oh, and there we have. <laughs> We're going to get to that question a little bit. This is sure. uh, what you're seeing now, folks, is uh, the Grissom Memorial. Jill, kind of tell us what we're seeing there, up here. Sure. Well, one of the things we wanted to do with the new memorial is really give people a better understanding of the life of Gus Grissom and how he got to where he did. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're seeing right now is a lot of his um, boyhood memorabilia, his time in scouts, his grade reports, yeah. which I think it's, it's really neat for children to really see his grade reports yeah. and understand that uh, even though Gus Grissom was not the most stellar student in his early days, you know, once he figured out what he wanted to do, uh, he really went for it. He turned out all right. What he we, turned what out all right. Yep. This is a, one of his flight jackets um, from mm. his time in Korea. Uh, and then after he left Korea, he actually became a test pilot. Mm -hmm. um, he had flown over 100 missions uh, in Korea and was really uh, interested in kind of pushing aircraft to new limits. Yeah. And it, it's from that, that program in the Air Force that the test pilot that he was eventually selected to be one of the first uh, the Mercury 7 astronauts. Oh, and the, boy, this catches your eye when you go in there. What were you looking at? Absolutely. This is the, cen the centerpiece of the memorial. This is the Molly Brown capsule. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what Grissom flew in his second flight into space uh, during the Gemini yeah, How uh, lucky program. are we to have that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a, a really neat addition. This is actually a live feed from NASA TV that we have in the memorial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things we wanted to look at in the memorial, not just how Grissom got to where he is now, but what his contributions mean for the future mm -hmm. of the space program. So mm -hmm. where things can kind of go from there. And so you, you see this whole lead up uh, of Grissom's life and, and then you see you know, what, what that's taken uh, NASA's program to now. Mm -hmm. uh, what you've just seen here in this case is some of our um, most interesting and a sad memorabilia. Um, the flag? The flag was actually the one that draped Grissom's coffin uh, after he lost his life, uh, along with uh, two other astronauts yes. uh, in testing for the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. 
Gemini three, the Molly Brown. Oh, what a what a yeah. what a great sight this is. Great, great story behind the naming of the Molly Brown too. Uh, it's yeah. actually named after the unsinkable Molly Brown from mm -hmm. a Broadway show. Uh, dealt talking about one of the survivors of the Titanic. Uh, Grissom took a little bit of ribbing. Uh, well, after his first flight on Mercury when his capsule there sank. And so the Molly Brown was a, a little bit of uh, kind of a tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> you know, what we're looking at now the, this, uh, the, uh, uh, is a space suit, my goodness. Yeah, it's also from Gemini. This is a and picture of his There you table. see that flag that we actually saw in the, yeah. in the case earlier. Yeah. Okay, uh, getting there a nice back. shot of the capsule. Wow. Here, we're very lucky to have this. Uh, and that case was... Uh, designed specifically to protect that capsule and sure we can we can keep it safe and protected for for future generations sure to see. Well, great preservation uh, special thanks for maria edwards and uh, for mark young of allowing us to come in and do this taping uh, great shots of the museum uh, that you know it is it becoming an old hat for you because you're around this museum a lot are it is it becoming you know, oh, well, yeah, I've kind of seen that for a while. Or is, is it something that, that you still see something new in every time? Well, I got to say, I literally see new stuff a lot because uh, all the, just about all of the items that you saw on display there uh, actually are not owned by the park, but actually are on loan to us from Betty Grissom, okay. uh, Gus's wife. And she, for the last uh, year and a half or so, has been... Uh, kind of randomly packing things up from her attic and shipping them over to us. Oh. And so we're just seeing, yeah, I'm just constantly being surprised by you know, the amazing things uh, that she has. And, uh, you know, only a fraction of what she sent us is on display right now in the memorial. Uh, we simply don't have room to put it all out. And it would take time to go through all that and to, and eventually to be able to display all this stuff. Uh, we just don't have the, and they want to build me a new memorial maybe four <laughs> or five times the size. Uh, we could maybe yeah. fit it all in, but our intention is actually to kind of rotate some stuff through. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have one case that's actually going to be dedicated to that. So each year we're going to change stuff out. So you, one one thing we want is for people who've seen the memorial once. We want to make mm -hmm. sure that when they come back next year, mm -hmm. there's going to be something new for them to see, yeah. uh, something different that'll, that'll help us even more tell the story of Gus's life. Yeah, you know, it it, it just uh, the work that, that you people put into something like this. People just don't realize, do they? The amount of time. It's a very and long process. <laughs> that, that goes into something like this, you know, and and uh, it is a, a, a labor of love certainly mm -hmm. that you folks do and we were very lucky uh, it, with the, the grissom memorial project and we had a wonderful uh, text writer and exhibit planner uh, lisa schools uh, mm -hmm. out of michigan who actually uh, worked with the uh, design firm to make sure that you know the text is what we wanted that the story was being told the way we wanted and actually yeah. really helped kind of guide us through each step of the process, made it a lot easier than would have been otherwise. Oh, it's fascinating. Uh, uh, getting back with the, uh, the Molly Brown, uh, the, the capsule that we see here, what's the history behind that? Uh, well, he, he flew that uh, on Gemini 3 mission, and the capsule itself is uh, very special in the history of the space program. Um, you mentioned in your introduction that Gus Grissom is the second American in space, mm -hmm. and he was. He was the first person in the entire world to fly in space. Oh, okay. Um, the very first capsules that went up, they got blasted up on the rocket, they spun around, they came back down. Um, in the Gemini 3 mission, uh, and they actually called this capsule the Gus Mobile because Grissom had such an input into the design of it. He was, of course, a test pilot. And what fun is it to, to fly in something if you can't fly in it, if you don't have any control over where you're going? Mm -hmm. And so one of the big uh, changes in the Gemini capsule is that the, the people who were in the capsule could actually change the direction of their flight. Uh, so. When Grissom went up in the Molly Brown, we say he was the very first person to actually fly in space because prior to the Gemini 3 mission, you were just dependent on where you got shot up, <laughs> basically. He actually adjusted the path of his orbit you know, Joe, uh, uh, in uh, space. And, and I don't want to interrupt, but, you know, uh, let me take this. This would have been a gutsy, brave move for somebody 
that you know that ha hasn't really been done in this fashion, like you say before mm -hmm. the first and this and the, and, the, and the second man actually, or the first man in this respect. But to be sitting on all that fuel, to being being shot up there, and this is in the in the infancy of our space program. This this man had some guts. Yes, and uh, some courage. You know, I can't I can't imagine doing what what yeah. these folks did and. Maybe that's that's why they picked from people like test pilots right. because they, these men had already just demonstrated they were crazy enough to to try out new things like this. No doubt. Uh, I I can't even imagine today, you know, being shot up into space. Even you know, yeah. forty years later, with all all the advances that have been made, right. still to still would scare me to death. Oh, it, it uh, thought of doing that when the program was first starting. It, yeah, it's amazing. Again, oh, I don't know if we just. We we sure are uh, uh, enough of appreciation for the uh, for Gus Grissom because you know I mean my goodness uh, and for uh, some uh, past generations uh, my generation still I was uh, 14 years old when uh, Gus Grissom died but uh, I grew up learning about Gus Grissom because uh, and and certainly like the movie The Right Stuff uh, brought back into attention that was a great movie you ever seen that I have not oh my goodness you got to watch that but um, it does a great job of uh, bringing to light these seven astronauts that were picked uh, for that and, uh, and Gus Grissom. But uh, I don't know if we have as much appreciation as we should have for our local hero there because uh, he, had, he did have a lot of guts and courage to be able to do this. Well, I'll even go one step beyond that. Okay. We ought to have a lot of uh, appreciation recognition for the families that were left behind. That's good. Uh, as hard as it was for these astronauts uh, to, yeah. to go up and do this. My Imagine goodness. what it had to be like for their wives and their children oh, exactly. uh, sitting at home and, and not having any control, you know, for, for me, it's like, you know, flying a plane versus driving on, on the highway. When I fly a plane, I've got no control over what happens to me. At least, you know, when I'm in the car, I feel like I have some control over the situation. I may have yeah. a higher risk of death, but I feel I have more control <laughs> over it. Right. You know, with these families at home, I mean, you know, for the astronauts, they're, they're sort of the ones in the car, and the family at home is kind of the one at the airplane. You know, they're just being carried along. Right. They don't really have, any, you know, a lot... Um, control or you know what's happening to their loved ones yeah. uh, you know here they are you know Gus being shot up into space mm -hmm. you know one of the first people to do that I mean that that had to be terrifying for the families and the the amount of strength that must have took them to, to really get behind these men right um, I won't let my husband do it <laughs> Uh, but Jill, you know, you mentioned that a lot of this stuff was on loan, uh, you mm -hmm. know, from the family. Now, the stuff that Betty is sending you, is this mm -hmm. on loan too, or is this going, is this permanently for the museum? These items are, are on long-term loan, um, and we're working out the final uh, language of that loan agreement, but we're hoping to, to do something along the lines of, uh, you know, a 99-year loan or something so that, you know, we really can guarantee that... Uh, these, these items are going to be available for people to see for a while, but they are still Betty's personal items, and, and it, we're just incredibly thankful oh, yeah, <laughs> that, I, she's, I that, that she's uh, been letting uh, us uh, We'll make sure, them. in fact, if we could ever get an address, I'd love to send Betty even a, a copy of this show. I mean, but we, because we do appreciate what she's doing. We really it's do. I don't know if I can get an address for her, but if I can, I, I'm going to do that, send her a copy of this. Uh, do, is there still some of his family that is around in Indiana at all, or are they all? There you know, is, uh, and there there's still family around in Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, over the years, that last few years, I've been at Spring Mill, and in the context of the the exhibit renovation, I've actually been working with Steve Grissom. Mm -hmm. And um, right. Steve uh, has taught, helped us, uh, you know, communicate back and forth with Betty and figuring mm -hmm. out what a lot of the stuff that she's sending us is. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve and I know just, Steve, he's a social studies teacher at Mitchell, yes. right? and uh, yeah. he's, he's a good guy, and he'd be one that, uh, you know, that I, yeah, he he's should done be here. a lot of you know, <laughs> you're doing a great job, and, uh, but Steve would be like one I'd like to have on the program sometime. He's but. got an incredible knowledge right. of um, Gus's career and, and his story leading up to, you know, the more public aspects of this career, right. kind of the, the how he got to where he is, and Steve was just an incredible help. You know, I'll, I, I will admit I very little background in the space program. Uh, so for me coming into to this, you know, seeing all this stuff laid in front of me, I didn't really have much of a context right. for what this stuff meant. Um, and in a lot of cases, I had not a clue what some of the things are. And uh, Steve came in and really helped, you know, right. not just to identify stuff, but to really uh, help me 
and then in turn, you know, all this stuff gets turned over to our designer, the public, uh, understand what exactly the significance of these items are right. and how special they are. We'll do a second program. I'll get Steve on. You know, he's helped me with the History Festival before in the past, and we'll get Steve on the program, and that would be a good follow-up to this program on a future date. Uh, okay, back to uh, the renovation. Uh, uh, it is, when did this renovation start of the museum? Well, we closed down, uh, well, the entire process is pretty long, but as far as the actual physical work uh, inside the memorial, we closed it down last September mm -hmm. and started doing the renovations. And one of the first things that we did was actually, uh, our own park staff did a, uh, the maintenance staff did an amazing job on the interior. Uh, when you go into the memorial today, the exhibit area is twice the size of what it was pre-renovation. Hmm. Because the office space um, for our park office was actually in the memorial building. Okay. And it's no longer there. It's, not, mm -hmm. it's now exhibit space. So mm -hmm. uh, our staff went in and did all the interior renovations to actually merge the office area with the original exhibit area, um, putting in new doors, tearing out lofts, uh, doing painting all over, uh, just really making it really look nice and making everything flow through. Mm -hmm. And uh, then this winter, then we started doing, s the exhibit company started coming down. It was Icon out Fort Wayne uh, was our exhibit company. And they started coming down and um, we actually brought a forklift in through the front doors <laughs> of the museum to lower right? the capsule down to the ground. It was kind of um, raised onto a pedestal. Mm -hmm. So they actually, we took out the front doors and came up with this forklift. They've got some neat footage of the, <laughs> the forklift lowering the capsule down. It's kind of, you know, the guy on the forklift and 40 people standing around, you know, tensed and waiting, <laughs> and, and, and hoping and it all you've got, went well. And this guy has the responsibility. Here's an historic, I mean, yes. big time yes. right in your hands here. So, you know, uh, I would be nervous. In, I have in never seen a forklift so. move something so slowly. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it was something. It was a whole day to get that capsule lowered safely down. Oh. Uh, and then we were able to you know, uh, do some more finish work. And then over a period of uh, about two weeks or so uh, in April, uh, we moved, the exhibit people came in and did all the the installation mm -hmm. and we started getting the artifacts in and we did a soft opening then in May for the school groups okay. and uh, then for Grissom Days this year in July we have uh, did official dedication. Actually I've seen memorial. some film footage of that on the dedication mm -hmm. of that and to listen to his son I believe you know talk a little yes. bit there and, uh, and and that was really interesting and um, uh, there was, uh, and I bet he didn't come back for that, is that correct? She, she, no, unfortunately she was not able to make it. Okay. Um, she's living down in Houston, Texas mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. and um, it, she tried to figure out a, a way to make it up, but ultimately, um, you know, health reasons, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it just, just wasn't able to, to yes. make the trip. Yeah. But we were very blessed to have one of, um, one of her sons, Scott, right. come, um, and one of Gus's brothers, Lowell. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, was able to make it as well, uh, oh, in addition fantastic. to quite a few, you know, extended family members oh, that, who yeah. were there. Yeah. It, was, it was very nice. I, I imagine it was. Uh, back to the capsule, uh, how did you guys manage to get from NASA the, the capsule? How did, you, how did you guys, you know, uh, you know, because I would assume that someone else would have wanted that capsule. Yeah, and you know, I, I have to admit, this all happened before I was born, <laughs> so yeah. I'm not completely familiar with the whole story behind yeah. uh, it, and the political maneuverings, I'm sure, that oh, went on to goodness. get it here, yeah. uh, but it is, it's, it's still not ours. Um, it's on a loan to us from the Smithsonian Museum. Okay, so it's uh, through Smithsonian mm -hmm. that's a capsule. Yeah, the Smithsonian uh, oversees all the, the artifacts from NASA, from the early space program, and I assume mm -hmm. from the modern space program as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuff gets turned over to the Smithsonian for archiving. Uh, but you know, I mentioned that the exhibit case that the capsule is in, mm -hmm. uh, we, that's specifically designed to meet uh, new standards uh, or more recent standards that the Smithsonian has developed for the preservation of the capsules. So uh, the case itself is not just a case that they threw together. I mean, this has not to have just. certain material and so forth, like maybe for the reflection of, of I don't know how. Exactly. UV you, protection, uh, climate control, 
uh, lots of stuff. I mean, in the early days, uh, and again, this predates me by quite a bit, but I've seen pictures. Uh, when the capsule was, was first brought to Memorial, it was sitting at ground level, mm -hmm. and the door was off, and people could actually climb in and have their picture taken sitting in the capsule. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, nowadays, I think we, I do remember that. We yeah. look back at that, and we, we think about all the things that are missing from the interior of the oh capsule, some of the damage. Uh, but what a cool experience, you know, to no, be able no. to sit in the capsule. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be very, I, I can almost picture if someone gave us the money to do it, it'd be neat to build like a replica of the capsule right. that people, you know, kids could get oh, and, stuff, and, and take you know, their you picture know, in. You know, I, I can remember, it seemed like I remember, I don't ever be, remember being excited about it, it seemed like I can remember looking, being able to look into that. And, you know, I'm too claustrophobic to think uh, being cooped up in that capsule for how long would he have been cooped up in that? Uh, yeah. Okay, I think his flight was 36 hours. Well, th that would have been uh, about uh, 35 and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> 35 and a half hours too long uh, for yeah. me, Jill, to be uh, cooped up actually, in that small space. And there were two space. men in there. Yeah. There were two men. It wasn't just it wasn't just Gus. Do you uh, remember who the other man, who the other astronaut too. was? Um, yes. And now, <laughs> this is one of those things where I could have said it before you asked me. Um, John, it I'm going to remember it, it again. It wouldn't be Andrew. John Glenn. No. No, it wasn't John Glenn. Um, I would have remembered that. Okay, but we've we got John. <laughs> you did okay, this to well, me. later on, if it, if it pops in your mind later it will, on, it will pop know. into my mind later okay, on. I can't believe it, I'm forgetting it now. Yeah. I feel very. Yeah, if I, I, well, I've done that before. You edit this part out, right? <laughs> no, we like this part. Uh, actually, um, but uh, so, you know, uh, being able to get something like that again and display and here and, uh, you know, I can remember just actually a, a few years ago, it seems like, that when they discovered the unsinkable Molly Brown, is that the one that, yes. they, that they went in and they found that when the latch door came open and he just about lost his life on that, didn't that he? That was the Liberty Bell. Liberty Bell, Liberty I'm sorry. Liberty Bell. Liberty mm -hmm. Bell, okay, yes, that's, that's mm -hmm. correct. Now they have that, they were able to actually bring the Liberty Bell yes, up. Yes, I believe and, 1999, uh, I want to say. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, somebody, I can't remember the name of the person who did it, but he kind of dedicated almost right. his life for a couple of years to finding the Liberty Bell and, and bringing it up from the ocean. For, I believe, I don't know if that's the one that was, saying, one that was involved with the finding of the Titanic. It seemed like maybe. I think it might, might I, have been, that, but and, I don't know, want to say And again, sure. people out there can email me and correct me, but it seemed like there was a connection there between the man that uh, discovered the Titanic and Liberty Bell, but uh, that, again, Steve would be able to give some information on that. But, uh, and that has probably been restored, and that is being housed somewhere, maybe in Texas or? I think it's at the Air and Space Museum Okay. right uh, now. Yeah. Um, and that or, kind the, of, or the I, Cosmosphere in Kansas. That has always been, a, a, I know, a, a big debate whether or not that he panicked and pushed, the, you know, and whatever. But mm -hmm. I think that they, they proved that it just, there was a flaw somewhere in there and that it kind of... Uh, yeah, actually, the, you know, it's kind of too late almost. But, you know, once they got the capsule out and were actually able to examine it, right. uh, the indication seems to be that, yeah, Grissom... He, Grissom didn't panic. Right, and, and <laughs> there, there was, was glad, a malfunction. And I was glad that they came out uh, mm -hmm. because that, uh, and and you know he would have been he would have been very happy to hear I that. I think that, so. That, I think so. Yeah, and I know his family was there as well. When you look at this uh, this beautiful museum, and back to do people just come in to just to State Park just John to look Young. at that? John Young. I told you. I told you it would good. come to me out of nowhere. Oh, there you good. go. All right, John Young. I get that out so everybody knows. I did not forget it. Okay, good. Well, I knew you. I knew you'd been. Uh, do people come just to look at the memorial, the, the museum itself? Uh, you know, or do they just come to Spring Mill and they go, "Oh, well, I didn't know I was there," and they just happen to go by? Uh, do people just come for that purpose? Uh, people come for for both reasons. Uh, I think a, uh, probably the, the largest quantity of people are, are coming to the park and are going to experience the park, and the memorial is part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is certainly a core of people out there mm -hmm. who are just, uh, you know, very intrigued by the space program mm -hmm. and, you know, deliberately seek out mm -hmm. um, what they can find for that. And so we do get a percentage of our visitors each year do come specifically for the memorial. Okay, yeah. The, uh, uh, and, and people, what, what do you think is the favorite part of the people that go in there of the museum? Why do, they, why do you think that they gravitate to? Well, I guess in the, the new exhibits for the kids, uh, there is a model plane 
uh, that's in one of the exhibits mm -hmm. where kids can actually work the controls and oh. they can learn about thrust and all that sort of thing, what, how an airplane flies while actually moving the controls, changing kind of the, I don't know if it's called a rudder <laughs> it's on a plane, <laughs> but changing the wing flaps and, and all of that sort of thing oh, to actually sort that. of fly the plane. So that's what yeah. the kids all tend to gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. And the, of course the capsule, uh, the Molly Brown capsule just, just grabs everybody. Right. Uh, I would say for the adults, um, uh, by and large, I, I see them lingering a lot uh, over the the Apollo mm -hmm. items. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think the, this amazing man um, and you know the tragedy that everything ended. I think it really really hits the adults particularly hard. Yeah. Um, thinking about you know this whole life leading up um, to this, and you know this really was a tragedy that never should have happened, and uh it's. People really linger at that part. You know, I, uh, I, it's one of those uh, things that I can remember where I was at whenever I heard the news about mm -hmm. Virgil Grissom being killed. Uh, it was like whenever uh, when uh, John F. Kennedy was killed. I can remember where I was at, and I can for Virgil Grissom as well. It was, it was a tragedy for these three men that have died there. And I understand that the spot where they died is still uh, there. It wasn't torn down or anything. I guess it's left kind of as a memorial there. I believe it is. Mm -hmm. For those, those three those three men. What is your favorite part of the museum? Mm. I really like the stuff from the boyhood, uh, mm. the, the little personal artifacts. Uh, and I guess I like, uh, actually one of the items I like the most is uh, not even on display okay. <laughs> right now. We actually have um, some of Gus's bridge work. Is that right? And it's just such a, uh, an odd thing to have in a collection. Mm -hmm. But to me, it really, really kind of sinks home uh, the idea that Gus was a real person. Mm -hmm. You know, he had to go to the dentist just like all the rest of us mm -hmm. and get his teeth fixed. And, you know, here's his bridge work to show for it. Yeah. And it's, it really personalizes him to me. It makes him a real person, yeah. uh, someone that actually existed, uh, you know, not just this kind of you know, person out there who's untouchable. He was, he was one of us. Yeah. And I, I just think that's really cool. And, and then the idea that Betty saved his bridge work all these years, I've, I just find fascinating. These are really personal items that, he's, yes. that she's sharing with people. Very much so. For history. Very much so. And, and that's what we really wanted out of the, the renovations here, is we wanted to share that personal side of Gus. Right. We wanted people to really be able to appreciate that this was a real person right. um, that did all this. If you had a chance, Jill, to have been able to sit down with Virgil Grissom for just an hour, what would you have liked to have asked him? If you were, hadn't been able, <laughs> what would you have wanted to really to know about? Oh, wow. What were you thinking would probably be on my mind. And I can't imagine the thought process that, that went behind willing to be. I'm terrified of heights, which is probably part right. of the reason. But yeah. I, so were you scared? Were you yeah. asking? You know, probably. Uh, well, I, I know they had, they had to have been. Sure, certainly, and they had to have been terrified. re-entry back in. And yeah. My goodness. I mean, they were the first people doing this. Uh, you know, how could they not have been scared? But I, I think, you know, knowing a little bit more about how they got past that mm -hmm. um, would be really interesting. Uh, you know, these men knew that they would, certainly that they were making a, a contribution to the to future of the world. Well, you know, they were fully aware of the risk. Mm -hmm. And I believe I've read a, a, a statement of his that he made concerning that, that, mm -hmm. that he was fully aware of the risk. Fully aware of the risk. And uh, he said that, you know, if we die in pursuit of this goal, every, every step will still have been worth it. Yeah. Um, and it's you know, tragic that that actually happened. Yep. Um, but you know the contribution uh, that his death and his crewmates made to the program, um, it was an awful thing that happened. But because it happened, we were able to actually get people to the moon safely. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know the, when the Apollo One happened um, and was actually on the test pad, they yes. weren't even getting ready to actually launch. They were just doing tests on it. Yeah. Uh, but they were able to, as a result of that tra tragedy, identify a lot of deficiencies in the capsule mm -hmm. that uh, made the future possible. Yeah. Um, it was a flash fire. It, it was a pure, pure, pure oxygen, oxygen environment. Um, and you know, there's literally miles 
of uh, wiring that ran through these these capsules. That's amazing. And you know, just all wrapped around each other, tiny sparks somewhere uh, yeah. ignited that pure oxygen environment, and they weren't able to to get out in time. Yeah. And um, well, we you know, it. Yeah. It made a, such a difference for the people who came after them. Yeah. Uh, not the way you want it to happen, right. but uh, still. We, we, we celebrate his life. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, we concentrate on is uh, the celebration of his life and, uh, and uh, his contribution, like he said, to the, the program and to Lawrence County and to the state of Indiana. He was an amazing man. Really? Well, he deserves the title hometown hero, that's I for sure. I believe so. Jill, you have uh, really, uh, you've brought us a lot of great information. And I'm going to tell our people out there, if you haven't been to this Virgil Grissom Memorial at Springville State Park, it is well worth your time to take an hour, hour and a half, whatever, to go in there and take a look at that. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and, and just to see the beautiful uh, memorial that we have right here in our own county. And it's a shame that... Uh, here that people travel from the different states to come to see this. I know that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, people from other countries have come in to look at this memorial. And we probably have had people that live right here that has never stepped foot inside. And it's time that they take it. Absolutely. And the memorial is open year-round, too. Mm -hmm. So looking for something to do on a snowy day this winter? All right. Come on over. It'll be open. <laughs> uh, actually, it's, it's free getting into the museum itself, but there will be a, a fee at the, you know, get into the state park unless you've got a, a year-long pass like I have because I go to the park often. So I buy that, uh, that I get that good deal and get in that, that. that yearly pass every year. And so, uh, but there would be a gate fee uh, to get in, I guess, but um, it's free actually getting into Memorial itself. Yes, well absolutely. Worth it. Joe, I want to thank you for uh, coming on to the program today for your time that you spend in this, uh, in this endeavor. Again, it is, I know, a work of love. It's a job for you, but yet it is more than a job for you. Yes. And, uh, is there anything else that you want to think of as we close that you think, oh, I wish I'd have said this? Because <laughs> every time I, uh, I, we go to black, somebody says, oh, I wish I'd have said this. Is there anything else you want to say in conclusion? Oh, my. I'm probably going to do the same thing all your other guests <laughs> are doing. Okay. Uh, I just hope people do take the time to, yeah. to come out, see the memorial, uh, to come back year after year to see the, the new stuff that we, we do uh, rotate on display. Right. And if anyone has a particular research interest and wants to uh, see some of the stuff that isn't on display right now, mm -hmm. um, they're free to get in contact with me and be happy to, to let people uh, take a look uh, at some of the stuff that, that isn't on public. Uh, at the yeah. end of the show, can we put your email address up? Or sure. can, uh, if people want to contact you about the questions about the memorial, can they do that? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. We will have that uh, address up. Uh, we've been talking with Jill Vance uh, with the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources today, talking about the Virgil Grissom Memorial. It is a fantastic place to visit, and we hope that you'll take the time this fall or this winter to go out there and spend a little bit of time there. This has been Norm Taylor. You've been watching the Lawrence County Oral History Project. Thank you for watching. We'll be seeing you somewhere around the bend. Thank you.